Hi, everybody. Welcome to the broadcast. It is Monday, January 2nd, 2017. This is really one of my favorite topics lately that I've been thinking about, and that is what is therapy? What distinguishes therapy from psychoeducation? And, and how can this inform us as people, as parents, when working with children who are struggling with mental health and addiction issues? So I'm going to take this one a little bit loosely, meaning I'm going to kind of meander around the topics and tell some stories and, and give examples as we go along. And I hope for all of you, for your own therapy, uh, for, for the uh, as you become a witness or are a witness to your child going through the therapeutic process, I hope this can be helpful to you to figure out how you can support it. And I think for me, understanding what therapy is for myself as a client, has changed over the years. I think about when I enter therapy with this, with the therapist that I have now in 1999, and I thought about what it was like then and, and what I was trying to get accomplished. I was trying to think about this this week, and I was thinking, I, I think back in 1999, I, I knew I, I was struggling with some issues. I knew that, that in our marriage that we needed to figure out how to be together in a different way. And and at first I thought it was about solving that problem. That's really what brought me to the table, if you will. I talk about that idea that Winnicott says that it's the false self that brings the real self into therapy. So that was what my mind thought. I thought, I'm going to get into therapy. I'm not miserable. I'm not globally unhappy, but I can still feel myself falling back into old cycles. How am I stuck? in the process. And of course, remember, and this is obvious from, from who I am in my profile, I had at that time been a therapist for, for several years. So I had the education, I had the psychology, I had the information, but it was the process of therapy that, that began to change me and change for me over the years. I can remember one point being very discouraged. I, I actually remember where I was when I was driving and I thought, I don't want to go to therapy this week, it's just not working. And this was 15, 16 years ago. I was thinking it's not working and in my mind what I thought was it's not making me happier. It's not taking away the problems and I, and I thought that the problems were out there, that I was experiencing them and, and I remember talking to my therapist about that and have her, having her respond like she always does with, okay, you can do what you want. And, and then the way I think about therapy now, and in fact I was, my session last week with my therapist, my thought was I I don't recall being happier than I am right now in my life, in, in all areas of my life, family life, professionally, personal life. I can't remember being happier right now. And still, I, I find therapy all the more rewarding, all the more beneficial to me. So I'm going to talk about that. And for those of you that might be new to our broadcast and might be new to our program, I'm going to end with this tonight, but I want to start with this also, and that is let it sink in. Listen to it for a while. I think for a lot of us, it's, it's a new language. It's what I call a new sensibility, that is, a new way of being in the world. And some of it's not going to make sense at first. And so as, as you listen to it, as you study it, as you learn about it, as you participate in therapy, I think you'll hear things differently. I think so much about the idea about therapy providing people with new ears and new eyes. Right? That's one goal that I have, one objective that I have with the parents that we work with is, um, sorry, I forgot to start the, the um, I'm going to start over. I apologize. I'll cut this out later. Okay? Forgive me. I forgot to start the podcast, so you're going to hear another introduction again. I apologize. I don't think I've ever done this before, but here we go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the broadcast. It is Monday, January 2nd, 2017, and this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart, one that I've been thinking about a lot lately. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to give you some quotes. I'm going to tell some stories. I'm going to meander around the topic of therapy as I see it. And for me, the idea of therapy has changed over the years. When I first entered therapy with the most recent therapist, the therapist that I now have back in 1999, I thought it was one thing. I wasn't globally unhappy, but I found myself getting stuck in old patterns and old cycles and old dead ends. And I thought as, as therapy, uh, therapy as getting me unstuck out of that, which it did, which it, which it was. But I thought about it that simply. I can remember one time, I still remember where I was when I had this thought and shared it with my therapist on the phone. I said, I don't think I want to go to therapy this week because I don't think it's working. Because in my mind at this time, this was 15, 16 years ago, I thought the problems were out there. 
I wasn't dismissing therapy as a practice, but I thought it's not going to take away or improve my circumstances. And, and that's what I thought all those years ago. And, and mind you, at this point in my life and in my career, I'd already been a therapist for several years. So I, I had the education. I, I had the psychology, right? But, but there was something that I was missing. For a lot of the people that I work with that, that we teach at Evoke or that we take through the process, I hear them share with me all the time that in, in the beginning, it doesn't make sense. Some of the things we talk about, some of the things we say don't make sense. But after listening to it for a while, after going through a, a transformation of self, everything becomes much more clear. And things that they couldn't understand months or years ago now make crystal clear sense. And so it's one of those things where when you're changing paradigms, when you're changing your sensibility, your way of being in the world, when you're getting new eyes and new ears, and that's the way I think about th this work, parent education and therapy, is providing ourselves, each other with new eyes, new ears, then things change and things make sense where they didn't before. So that's what this webinar is about tonight. It's about thinking about what is the process of therapy. I hope it offers you some insight into the work that you're doing personal, personally in your own therapy. And I hope it also provides you some insight to the process that your child is going through. That, that as you witness and watch them and are a, a bystander to their therapeutic process, it can help you. I also believe that it can inform you as a parent. I, I, I find a closer and closer connection, the older I get, the more I do this work, between my being a therapist and, and, and whatever that process is, and my being a, a father or a friend or a, a spouse. I hear people say, you know, they, they talk about therapists therapizing, you're not my therapist, but good therapy is, is healthy relating, right? Good therapy is providing a safe place, a context for the other person to be other, compassion, patience, curiosity, a seeking to understand and hopefully empathize with the other person. And all of those things should feel very natural. Right? Ideally, they feel natural to us in all of our relationships, and that's what we're striving for. So that's kind of the backdrop for tonight's broadcast is my ideas about therapy and, and how they can inform us and help us in our various roles in life. So let's get right into it. A quote from Jamie Gill from her, her book, The Mexico Papers, and there's a few volumes of it. She says, many therapists are happy to assume the position of the expert or guru and make the mistake of providing advice and answers to questions that suggest they know the truth for their clients. However, the helpful therapeutic experience is not just to be told things, but to have a different kind of experience. This allows the client to discover a whole different kind of self other than who he or she was. So, so again, the, the expertise in therapy is not the information that we provide. There are tools and techniques and skills and information that are a part of the process, but that's not the real transformational process. It's being in a room, in a relationship with somebody, and having a different experience. And that experience is transformative. And that's what Jamie's talking about here. She's talking about creating a different experience for people. And then when we have this different experience, we can, in this new context, recognize our other and old contexts. And when we recognize those, then we can, we can heal those, we can respond to those. We start to realize that the context, that the thing that we thought was normal isn't normal. I think a lot of, most of us, grow up in, in our families thinking this is normal, and it's not. It's not normal in the sense that it's, it's, it's unique. And we think it's the truth about the world. And it's not the truth, it's one truth, but it's not the whole truth about the world. And that's what she's talking about. So you have this different experience, and this experience changes you. It's part of the concept behind, behind the name Evoke Therapy Program, is to evoke an experience in somebody, to pull something out of somebody that is inside, that that experience facilitates and provides for them. A couple of more quotes, one from a paper that my wife and I uh, published, and it's coming out this month, and then another one from the Mexico Papers. From our paper on psychology versus therapy, we write, the inexperienced therapist might take the position 
I am a good person. I'm a, I am successful. Therefore, I will show, share my wisdom with my clients. I will become their teacher and their advisor. Gil criticizes therapy and this pro approach and noted, therapy has become problem solving rather than a process of discovery of self. The discovery of self is not fostered by offering advice or answers, but rather by asking better questions. And going on further, Gill says, the therapist or guide we choose must not duplicate the wounds of the past. Thus, if the therapist or guide knows what is right for us and manipulates us to achieve, achieve these treatment goals, it is abuse plain and simple. It is hard to see how good abuse ever cures bad abuse. And I think that's a dramatic paradigm shift for most of us. I think most of us think of it as problem-solving therapy. A lot of you hear me talk about this idea that, that I, I don't want to give advice, that I try not to give advice with my clients. That's not just a technique or a gimmick. That, that comes from a, a, a deeply felt belief that that's not what this is about. That's not what the process is about. The process is about providing a context where you can learn to think, learn to feel, figure out your intentions, figure out your relationships to others. And starting with, of course, that core piece, which is who are you? What, what is yourself? And how does it fit into this puzzle that we call life and relationships and parenting? And this idea of good abuse uh, curing bad abuse. It's a very important principle because I think a lot of, of therapists come into this field thinking what, what we say they, they think, that, that I'm a good person, I'm going to offer this wisdom, I'm happy, my life is going pretty well, look at me, let me offer you a, a path toward that. Right? I'm going to give you answers, I'm going to help you solve problems, help you achieve these goals. And to, instead of, again, pr providing a, a place, a safe context, a safe container, for you to figure out you and your truth in the process. And I think that's the enduring thing that we offer in, in a healthy therapeutic process. We offer a place for a person to, to discover themselves. Jessica Benjamin taught that the root of the self is found through another person. When we are found, we can recognize ourselves. And this recognition al may allow us to heal the wounds that are at the root of our symptoms. Therapy is not a place where we go to be called on our stuff or to be confronted. There's no talent in that. There's no healing in that. Therapy is a place where we go to listen to, it's not a place we go to listen to difficult things, but rather a place we go in order to share difficult things. And so that speaks to how important the response of the therapist is or the parent is. I have a talk this weekend in, in New York City, I'm going to be doing a webinar on it next Monday talking about how to talk to your children about drugs, both before they start using or as a preventative piece or after they start using or become addicted as a healing piece. And so much of that is, is learning to listen and learning to get to a place where we can invite them into a discussion where they can figure themselves out, where they can reconnect to themselves. And then when they reconnect to themselves in our presence, we are then connected to them in the process. So, again, it, it's a new sensibility. It's a new way of being in relationship. It's, a, it's what a lot of, we talk about all the time in all these webinars. It's what our communication skills model is built on, is what you learn when you go to Al-Anon, or Codependence Anonymous. It's what you learn when you're writing letters and having phone calls with your, your children in our program. It's when you're doing the parent visits. This is all practice to learn to be in a different kind of relationship with them. And in order to do that, we have to do a few things, right? We, we, have, to, we have to get enough support. I, I think about this all the time. We have to get enough support. You have to get enough support to have enough capacity to be there for them. And that's a hard thing, especially when children are, are struggling with mental health and addiction issues, especially when they're doing things that are dangerous or potentially harmful at least or, or threatening or anxiety producing or cruel or mean. It's hard to have the capacity to be there for them in this way that I'm describing when those things are happening. So what do you do? You go and talk to a therapist. You go and talk to your sponsor. You go to a meeting and you share. You get your needs taken care of so that it doesn't happen in the context of the relationship of, of parenting, right? That's the place you go to give. That's the place you go to be the container. But, but you still take care of yourself 
You just do so much of that outside of the context of that relationship. You do it in other places. So what is a self? We talk about the self. What is a self? It's, it's who you are. And, and what is who you are? What does that mean, who you are? It's what you like, what you want, what you believe, what you feel, what you think, what you prefer, what you stand for. We talk about this at the intensives. Do you like broccoli? What, what is your truth about that? And I make this joke at the intensive when I do the three circles exercise. I explain, how many of you can relate to this? You tell somebody, a group of people or a person serving you or you're eating with friends or, or family, you tell them that you don't like something. For me, that, that's squash. I don't like squash. And to this day, I can almost never tell anybody that I don't like squash without them saying, but try this squash. It has a lot of brown sugar on it. Or, or it's fried a certain way. And it's, it's, it's humorous, and it's lighthearted when I use this, this example, but it's an, interesting, it's an interesting idea, an interesting process, because it, it happens to all of us. People try to tell us. They, they don't listen to us state our truth, which, which is a simple and harmless one in that example. But in larger and more sensitive areas and more important areas, the same kind of thing can happen. We tell people what we want, what we believe for ourselves, and they try to talk us out of it. We tell them that they're sad, they try to make us happy. We tell them that it's hard, they try to point out the, the, the positive or the good side. We tell them that we're frustrated or that we're angry or that we want to get married or that we want to get a divorce or that we want to change jobs. And people, because they, they lack this capacity that I've alluded to, try to get us to change to fit inside something they can tolerate, that makes them comfortable. And, and that's not that much difference between it happening between two friends and it happening from a parent to a child. That is not to say, as I always say on these, that is not to say that we are passive and laissez-faire. People who know themselves, who, who identify the, the, the truths about themselves, what they feel, what they think, what they prefer, and are able to express that. They're active, they're assertive, they set healthy boundaries, they practice fantastic self-care, right? They set up clear expectations in relationships with others, including their children. It's not a passive part, part of the process. So it, it speaks to, it invites a, a level of assertiveness and clarity that is so powerful that when you yourself experience it, it's liberating and empowering, when you're around somebody else who, who is expressing themselves and their truth in this way, it's at times can be intimidating. It's almost so strong. But when we really sit with it, when we really are present with it, it it's an incredibly beautiful process. It's an incredibly strong and inspiring process. And so how do you find these things out? One of the ways you find them out is in therapy. Right? You go to a place where you get to be. The ideal contract in therapy is this. You come to therapy, you get to be you, end of deal. Right? That's the deal. You get to be you. And I know a lot of people will talk about saying being called on. I have clients ask me all the time to call them on their stuff. I don't prefer that language. I don't like that language because like I said earlier in the, in the quotes that I read, it, there's not a lot of talent in that. Right? I, I might say to a client, what if it was this way? What, what if you thought about it this way? Or what if you tried this? Right? I'll propose questions like that. I had a client at the intensive recently where I made a suggestion. And, and she later in, in the intensive asked me, why did you do that? It was, very, it was, it was a suggestion that to her was, was harmful, was painful. And I said, I just wanted to see how it felt to you. And I was just as happy for you to say no as I was for you to say yes. That's probably the difference between calling somebody on their stuff and, and having a, a wondering, having an idea that you share. As you put it out there and if the other person shoots it down or doesn't like it or doesn't prefer it, your response is, okay, that makes sense. I hear you. So you go to therapy where you can be yourself, where you can be found, where you can be heard, where you can be seen, and then you, you learn to see yourself. And it takes practice and it takes time. To do that. You can do that in other relationships that are safe or other contexts that are safe. Hopefully these 12-step step meetings 
provide that for you. And in, in, in 12-step meetings that we ask you to go to, you go and you share your story. And there's not crosstalk. Nobody calls you on your crap. They're allowed to share their experience, their strength, and their hope, what it's like for them. But they don't tell you what the truth is for you. They tell you, this is my truth. This is what I have found. And, and like I said, when, when, when we see our context, when we experience the, the other, the, 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 the not Brad Reedy growing up home, or, or the analogy that I shared the other night, the not water, where the two fish are, are, are greeted by the older fish and are asked, how's the water today, boys? And one of the young fish says to the other young fish, what the hell is water? When we experience the, the non-water, we can see what the water is. If everything is water, if everything we have ever known is water, then, then we can't see it. But if we experience something that is not it, then we can see it. That's what that means. And you start to learn to find your voice. If a therapist is always confronting you, always teaching you, always challenging you, that there's a piece in there that he or she is missing, and that is your voice. I can do just as much to help somebody grow and heal by finding the voice, finding the wound, finding their context, as I can by pointing out something else or calling them on their stuff or telling them how they're being unhealthy or irrational. Right? I could do just as much by doing that. And if I do that, if I, if I find their voice, if I find them, then in that process, they can find them and they, they can address it themselves. I don't have to do it for them. And, and, I, and I, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not in a great position to give advice. You don't want to follow my advice because it only applies to my life and to me. See, the right decisions come out of a greater sense of self. They arise out of one's truth. They, they aren't often the pathway to developing a healthier sense of yourself. Sometimes they can be helpful. Of course, there are skills and tools that we use, that we invite, that can help guide you, that can at times teach you about yourself, give you a new way of being in relationship. Those things can happen. But the more common path is, is you find this new, tr new self and you start to express it in the world differently. And that's why I go back to that idea of, of therapy being a long-term deal. You know, I, I think about it I think about it in my own therapy, and I said this just last week to my therapist, I could have given up on this years ago, and I would have lost so many important things that I've learned, very few of which have anything to do with solving my problems on a day-to-day -day basis, but that are about being a different person, knowing myself differently, and thus making different decisions. And then that, that process for me, for me, is what therapy is. You learn to be present with yourself because somebody else can be present with you. I can't emphasize this enough, and I've been thinking about this this week a lot. Our anxiety, our frustration with others, specifically our children, or if you're a therapist with your clients, our, our, our anxiety, our frustration, our anger, all of that, number one, is evidence of lost connection. Number two, suggests and is interpreted by the other person is something's wrong with me. If this person who seems to care about me or is an expert or is my parents who love me, if they're worried about me, something in me must be wrong. Versus if that person has curiosity, compassion, then I'm okay. And that's the irony of this all. If we all knew that we were okay, we wouldn't have any symptoms. That's the irony of it all. If we knew that we were okay, we would have very few symptoms, or, or the symptoms that we have would, would be healed more easily. When I know that I'm okay, I can own up to things. I can apologize for my mistakes. I, I don't create drama in my life. I don't lie. I don't try to justify. I, I, I know, you know, and, and where it is for me right now is, is on, in the moments in my life when I know that I'm okay, I guess I can just show up and tell the truth. And if something that I do or say gets interpreted in such a way that it's harmful or hurtful, my response is, I'm sorry. I can see it, right? I can be present with that and that person. So developing self is being okay with yourself, even your mistakes, even the things that 
people come to you with that, that they're upset about or angry about or frustrated about, about or, or, or suspicious of? More about advice. Like I said, we are experts, but our expertise is not the advice, not the information. That, that's a fairly easy tool bag to fill. Graduate students often graduate with a pretty decent tool bag. And they want to then impose that tool bag on people. Some of the most challenging training experiences that I have are with the freshly out of school PhD graduates, right? They have a head full of research and literature and they want to impose that on their clients. And this, this thing that I'm talking about right now doesn't make sense to them. It really is attachment-based therapy, which is incredibly rich in research and literature, but they don't know how it applies to this. And so we, we, we train, we practice, we become experts at this process. You'll, you'll notice that older, more experienced therapists are far less anxious, much more comfortable with themselves, much more comfortable with their clients, whereas newer or younger therapists get upset with their clients more easily, have less patience for their clients. I had a friend tell me recently that his therapist got really upset with him about something. He said that she felt frustrated and blindsided by something that he had announced to her. And I said, you know, that's not good therapy. He said, yeah, I know it's not. And he handled himself well in therapy and, and told her as much. That's not his to take care of. That's not the job. And when I was younger, I didn't know that. I didn't know that, that my frustration, my anger, my impatience with my clients was mine to deal with. I thought, this is a natural consequence. This is, this is me teaching them how to be in relationship with people. But that's the old context. That's what's, that's what, that already happened to them at home. And I had to learn how to do something different. It helps you to find yourself. Therapy ideally helps you to find yourself, your motives, your beliefs, your goals, your intentions. That's why I always talk about I, I don't, I don't want to challenge what you do, but I'll, I'll talk about why you're doing it. And so whenever I, I saw a client making a decision that seemed to be coming from a place of anxiety or control or shame or anger, whatever, whatever seemed to be clouding their clarity, their vision, their authenticity, we would talk about that. And I'd say, it's, it's okay. It doesn't matter what you decide. That's not going to be the thing. But let's talk about why you're thinking that. What's going on in there? You want to bring your son home, right? You want you want them to graduate next week, or or you want to send them away to a program. Let's let's talk about the the why. What's going on in there, so that we can learn about it, so we can understand, we can explore it some more. A, a lot of clients ask goal oriented choices, advice, right? Tell me the thing to do and think about. It. Think about how much this applies to you in all of your relationships, probably your, your children, but other relationships. Tell me what to do so I get the outcome that I want. Well, the outcome is getting to be you. That's the outcome, right? And getting to be you and, and doing that in relationship to others is all you can do. But if we teach you how to manipulate your children, right? That there's so many things in that that can go wrong. You ultimately turn them into an object, meaning something that is in, that gets things imposed on it, something that it gets controlled. It's really then about how good you are as a parent, how good of a manipulator you are. And that teaches them a whole, a whole lot. It's like, number one, you're, you are responsible for their failures. You are responsible for their successes. They're really your successes and your failures, not theirs. Right? It teaches that kind of relationship. Versus, you know, who are you? What do you want? How can you be that in relationship to them? How can you express that with them and in relationship? I don't want drugs in my home. I'm not going to allow that. I'm not comfortable with that. I don't want swearing or whatever it is. And this is, this is my space. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to express myself. I'm not mad. You're not wrong for wanting it. You're not bad for wanting it but I'm just not okay with it. So this is going to be my boundary. Then, because I'm the parent, these are going to be my limits and consequences. I'm going to set this up. If you're violent, if you're aggressive, this is what's going to happen, right? You get, to, it would be the same if you were a spouse. 
if you hit me, if you call me names, this is what's going to happen. And the, at the end of the day, you, we all have choices in, in all of our relationships. And, and, you know, it gets to that point when, when it gets beyond what you can do. Because parents say, but what if, what if I can't get what I want from them? And my response is, in, in, a, in, a, in a really difficult, profound, but subtle way, you don't get to get what you want all the time. You just get to be you. You get to set your boundaries and then they get to choose. So the question isn't, will it work? Because that doesn't make sense. The question is, what will make them do X or Y or Z? And I see therapists in the world talking about this, especially with mental health and, and, and children struggling with addiction and mental health. I see therapists implying that if you follow the rules, if you do A, B, C, and D, your child will be okay. But that's completely contrary to what we know about in psychology and what they teach in Al-Anon in Codependence Anonymous. That the whole program is set up for people whose family members are cocaine addicts and alcoholics and gambling addicts and sex addicts and all kinds of addictions, uncontrollable, incredibly destructive diseases. And the whole work is you don't get to control it. You can't stop it. You can't cure it. You didn't cause it. It's, it's all of those things. That's what we know. But for people that participate in those kinds of programs, that kind of work, they show up differently. And, and that can have profound impact, ripple effects in, in the people around them. And there are some people who, who can't show up differently. And, and so they, they end up not being a part of your circle, even when it comes to children or parents or spouses. After a time, you might not be in my circle anymore if this behavior is destructive and, and, and eats away at what I need to do to feel okay in my presence. So it's important as parents, and, and it's powerful. I can't, I can't emphasize this, this dichotomy, this dialectic too much. Doing it this way, thinking about it this way, is the most impactful thing that I know. As a therapist, as a human being, as a father, as a husband, as a friend. As a, as a child of my parents, I don't get all the wins that I want. I don't get everything I want. There, there's so much outside of my control that I don't get to have or to have it my way. But, but I win because I'm me. And then the people around me feel that. My daughter who works at a treatment center, we were talking about uh, some of the, th the challenges that she comes up with. She works with um, adolescent uh, females and she was saying how, how would you handle this situation or that situation she gave me example examples anonymous examples of scenarios and I said I would just do it I would just be myself I would just show up in that way myself and we were laughing about it and she's like give me tell me what you would say and I said we, we can role play it but but it, it'd be hard to role play because it's not a technique what I do is not technique -y. It, it's a, it's a constant centering process for myself that's my goal that's my ideal and then i'm in relationship with you with my child with, with my client in a different way and it makes a difference i, I like it. there's a phrase that uh salvador mnuchin called he used it slightly different but he called it a, an immovable a, an immovable object he said the therapist becomes the immovable object he called this this uh, joining which is building rapport relationship and at times you become the immovable object, which means that you're just you. You're not blown to by the wind. You just show up as you. And the person orients themselves in relationship to that immovable object. Like the cornerstone of a house. Everything lines up to that. So, so you change. You change. You are who you are. And you change through gravity. Right? People are attracted to you differently. And, and some people... It doesn't work for them, and they fall out of your orbit in life. So we work to, to show up authentically, right? That's that's the thing. That's what therapy's trying to help us to be, to be authentic, honest, and honest at, at every level, right? Honest with ourselves, aware of ourselves, compassionate, 
having integrity, being kind, loving. And the list can go on, of course, to several other. That's what therapy is about at any age. And it looks a little bit different when the younger the child is. But that's what it looks like. And so when we're coaching you on letters, sometimes we are using skills and tools to kind of help you find this piece that we're talking about, help you reorient yourself toward your child to have a different relationship with your child. You know, you say, I don't want my child to use drugs. And we say, this is, there's this way to talk about that that's different. Right? We're not going to use imperatives like you must, you, you never, you always, you have to, you're wrong, you're bad. We're going to change the language. And we're going to do that to give you a taste of what it would be like to be in a different kind of relationship with somebody where you say, this, is, this doesn't work for me. Here's what I, from my experience, here's what I have found out. And that's a different way of being with somebody. That, that, that's not saying, I know the truth for you. It's just, I know my truth. And I, I'm going to stand firm in it, on it. And I'm going to express it in a compassionate way. So if you're measuring yourself by whether it'll work or not, I can remember one, one therapist that I worked with who was really into uh, Al-Anon would always say at the end of something, after a client would say something, she would say, and maybe it'll work or maybe it won't. And what she was tapping into was the, the group, the participants in the group that I was watching her run, they were trying to figure out how to solve the problem. And the problem was they wanted person X to do Y or Z. And that was the problem in their mind. And she was reminding them by saying maybe it'll work and maybe it won't, won't, that that's not what this is about and you don't have control over that. I was talking to a client recently about this idea about something in a marriage and I was describing this and I was saying, you might try this. And she said, I'll do that then. And I said, but it could blow up in your face. She said, well, I'm not going to do that. And I was trying to, to, to demonstrate, to show her, you can't, you can't get control over somebody else. You can just be you. And that's why I, I like the phrase. This was first introduced to me by, by one of my supervisors about working with borderline clients, that you can't win with them, but you can choose how to lose. And I've extrapolated that idea, that concept, to all of our relationships, to all types of clients. You can't win, but you can choose how to lose. You can't win with an alcoholic, but you can choose how to lose. And when we abandon the idea that we can win, that we can be the right one, right? When we abandon that, we'll just show up. And the irony is, when we show up in this way, the, the, the vibrations are incredibly powerful in our lives and around us and others with others. Gandhi once remarked, one of my favorite quotes, a coward is incapable of, of, of exhibiting love. A coward is incapable of exhibiting love. It is the prerogative of the brave. Projection, fusion, going home is easy. Loving another's otherness is heroic. If we really love the other as other, we have heroically taken on the responsibility for our own individuation, our own journey. This heroism may properly be called love. You know, that's the concept behind the heroes, the heroic parent, the book that I wrote, is that the heroic journey, no matter what your story, no matter what your circumstances or your specifics are, the heroic journey is your own individuation. And that it is absolutely linked to loving other as other. The two are, it's the same task. It's the same journey. And that's what Gandhi is talking about here. So this changing sensibilities. Of course, you're going to keep them safe because we as parents cannot not do that. We cannot not do all that we can do to make sure that they're safe in the big picture. So once that gets handled, once that's clear to us, in the case of many of your children, that means they're going to come to this program. That means that you're going to put them in a place where self-harm, where uh, behaviors that could get them arrested or beat up, violence, behaviors that could lead them to drug addiction or have led them to drug, drug addiction, all of those are going to be taken out of the equation. But then, in this context, it's important to value the mistakes and the struggles. Because when we value the mistakes and the struggles, we're honoring the development of self. And that's a tricky thing for us therapists that evoke in the world 
is that when you're working with an adolescent or young adult and you have the parent on the phone, you're working with the parent at the same time, the parent, because their parent, wants them to be safe and okay. And we're going to let them stumble around. Not because we think that they're heading the right direction, but that's because how they learn. So there's a safety net. The way that I've described it over the years is you're not going to let them fall down a flight of stair stairs, but you're going to let them fall down one stair. You're going to let them trip and fall. You're not going to let them run into a subway train, but you're going to let them run, run into a wall or two. And, and the more you and we can adopt a, an attitude, a posture toward that behavior, toward those choices of, well, this is interesting. Like, what did you get out of that? What was that like for you? What does that mean? Tell me about it. The more we adopt that posture, the more helpful we are in this process. The more we get frustrated or angry, and it can be challenging because some of our children want to run into the same wall 50 or 100 times. But sometimes the reason they run into that wall 50 or 100 times is because they're running away from authority. They're running away from you and me and people that are experts telling them what to do. And they would rather run into that wall then lose self. Because that wall is the opposite direction of being consumed, of being annihilated, of being absorbed into somebody else. So I'd rather run that direction, even though there's a wall there, than, and then run the other direction and, and possibly experience the, the extinction of self. That's what that process is about. And so what looks like non-directive, what looks like passive is actually capacity. And so when parents ask us the question about, you know, does the therapist know that he or she is not going to get fooled? We don't want them to get fooled. We don't want them. It's not that. That's not what we're about. That's not what we're doing with your child. Because remember my experience, I've been in therapy with this therapist. I've been in therapy for 25 years overall. But with this current therapist, I've been in therapy for 17 years. And she still hasn't discharged me. She still hasn't cured me. I'm not done. And I, I don't anticipate being done with that in my life because it's not a problem-solving experience. And I don't go to it because I'm unhappy. I go to it to, to rediscover myself, to stay as close to that as possible, to continue to, to listen to myself through the process of therapy that I can distinguish my voice, my wants, beliefs, preferences, I don't like squash. I can remember that instead of all the voices that are asking me to be something else or suggesting that I should be something else or I'd be good or right or more lovable if I were something else. So we value the mistakes and we become a witness. Being a witness to somebody, being a patient, non-judgmental, curious and compassionate witness is the best way that we can contribute to somebody else's esteem. And, and being a witness to somebody, especially a child who does Silly, dumb, and dangerous things is one of the most challenging things that, that we can do. That is why you need help and support. Because children require more energy than possibly anything else in our lives. And then that energy needs to come from other people, not from the child. The child need not get, we don't want the child to get smaller, smaller or better or behave well or healthier so that you feel okay. We don't want them to do it for that reason. We want them to do it because it's their own process, because it's their own healing, because they're figuring themselves out. We don't want them to do that to, to feed you and your serenity. Remember, like they say in Al-Anon, your serenity, this is the same kind of thing I've been talking about all night tonight, your serenity is your responsibility, period. It is not your child's responsibility. That is one of the mantras, one of the slogans of a program that is designed for people whose loved ones are addicted to alcohol, drugs, sex, gambling, self-destructive behaviors. That's the mantra. Your serenity is your responsibility. So you got to learn to be a self. You know, we talk about self-care. I did a webinar on self-care. Self-care is important. But self-care is nurturing the self. Self-care, it's not, it's not just getting a massage or going running or taking a vacation. That's a part of it. But self-care is being responsible 
for your own happiness and going and getting it taken care of someplace. And sometimes that's recreation and sometimes that's therapy and sometimes that's with a, a, a great friend. Sometimes I talk about it, for me it's watching the, the Angels, the, Anaheim, the Los Angeles Angels or the Los Angeles Lakers game. Sometimes that's self-care. Sometimes self-care is telling somebody I don't want to talk about something or I'm done or not taking a phone call or staring at the wall right self-care is about learning to take care of myself and being responsible for that and when I do that and I do that well at the times that I do that and do that well I am more loving I'm more capable of love because love is about giving not about getting love is about something that comes out of me towards you it's not a contract that we do with each other love doesn't ask for something in return Right? Love is just, it flows. Self-care asks for something, and that's what I need to do. If you hit me, if you yell at me, if you swear at me, if you bring drugs into my home, I'm going to take care of myself. Right? But when it's time to love, I love. And that's a different thing. Understanding that listening, you know, how do I mentor a child? How do I mentor a client, a friend even? How do, I, how do I do something helpful for somebody? And, and it's the, the idea that listening is a is hundred times more valuable than talking. The great stuff that happens in these relationships, all of these relationships, is our ability to see and hear the other person, to understand them. That's why when we say, I don't understand X, or I don't understand Y, or I don't, I don't understand my child, or I don't, I don't understand why that person did that. Those statements, my, my answer to those is, well, that's kind of your job. You got to understand it. You've got to look at. You, doesn't mean understanding doesn't mean that you condone it. Understanding doesn't mean that you believe the same thing. That you excuse it. It's just under. I mean, why? Why do people commit these fantastic atrocities all over the world? It, it seems. It seems so incredibly, at times, difficult to understand. But we know why they do it. We understand the psychology of it the entire Star Wars series is built on it, right? We watch that movie, that series of movies, and we all understand it. We get what how Darth and Vader, Vader became Darth Vader, and we know what, what he's doing. And we know what Yoda is teaching, and we get it. We don't like it. It hurts us, but we don't not understand it. But if we can improve on understanding each other in the world, seeing each other, Again, not condoning, not excusing, not allowing for, but understanding, we, we can make a lot more change. So listening is more valuable than talking. And then being responsible for your own feelings. And, and, and making sure that you're doing what you need to do to take care of your serenity, your happiness, and your peace. And not handing that to your child. Not saddling them with, with your emotions and making them responsible for it. That's backwards. What are the take-home messages? This is not about getting it right. There's, there's a biblical phrase that says, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. I think there was a, a literalness to that story and to that phrase, but I also think that there's a metaphorical meaning to that, and that is if we live in the world of being right, that's what all the wars are fought over. Right? That's what all of this division is about in our society today, is who's right and who's wrong, versus being real. Like, I'm not trying, if I'm setting a boundary with you, I'm not right. I'm just me. I just don't like squash. I just don't like violence. I just don't like drugs. I just get to, I just get to have that want, that preference. So we learn to be ourselves. And we learn to value the other as other. Even our children. Right? I think about my own four children, how absolutely phenomenally different they are. Their strengths, their weaknesses, their gifts, their challenges are so different from each other. And, and, and I, I make it my goal, my practice, and I, of course, don't do this well all the time. Sometimes I do it very poorly. But I, I aspire to being with them and honoring their peace, honoring who they are. And, and I also do my best, and I'm doing better at this over time, and I want to do better even more so going forward, is not handing them my anxiety about how they're turning out and what they're doing. 
And I could probably, as a psychologist and parent, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a marriage and family therapist, but I could probably, as a therapist and a parent, use my, my knowledge of psychology and you know write down decisions that they're making that are unwise or you know not enlightened. I could do that all the time, but that, that doesn't help anybody. That's not the process. That's not how it works. This, this idea about it's not a technique. You know, when I say I don't give advice, when I strive not to give advice in, in my relationship, that's not a technique. That's a belief. That's a different way of being in a relationship to you. As, a, as, as an evoke client, as, as an intensive participant, as a private client, that's, as a friend, that's different. So, so when your child comes to evoke and when you're doing all this work, you know that old phrase, I think it was it's attributed to Einstein that insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. We're going to do it differently. We're not going to do a better version of what has been done. Like Jamie Gill calls it. We're not going to cure bad abuse with good abuse. We're not going to cure, cure, cure trauma with their learning disability or whatever has happened in their life with the divorce, with the adoption. We're not going to cure that with good abuse. We're going to cure it by being in a different kind of relationship with them and teaching you how to do that. And it's liberating and empowering. Um, and that's, that's what therapy is, I think. I, I, there's this, I was teaching uh, an intern at one of our intensives about counter-transference and transference, and that's some of what we're talking about tonight, um, about the, the therapist's feelings toward or about a, a client, right? And how that gets expressed. Um, and I was saying, you know, it, it's not going to be something that a lot of your professors, she's studying psychology, it's not going to be something that, that a lot of them are going to talk about. And she said to me, it seems like it should be the first thing they talk about. And I said, it's not. I didn't learn much about it in school. And, and do you know why? And she thought for a moment, she said, because they, they haven't done their work. And that's the answer. It's so much easier to talk about research and techniques and theory and models and interventions than it is to talk about and own your stuff. It's a much more vulnerable and challenging process. And that's what we teach. That's what I do with our supervision, with our staff and our therapists at Evoke. Let this stuff sink in over time. It takes a while. It's taking me a while. And I'm still learning about it. And I still take cases to... to to my therapist to do supervision with because I still got to figure myself out. Right? I still need to learn in the process and I still stumble over mistakes and make them with my children and make them with my friends and my wife and I'm learning in the process and I'm becoming more comfortable with myself so I can look at my mistakes and flub ups more honestly, more quickly and more courageously. So that's what this process is about. Let it take time. What if you're new? What what? And there's a lot of very experienced people on the on the list tonight that have been around for a while. I see, and there's a couple that I don't recognize that might be new. Um, if you're new, just keep listening. Keep listening to the webinars. Keep listening to the podcasts. Keep listening to your evoke therapist. Keep reading. Go to those six meetings, and things that don't make sense will make sense. And it's it's sometimes it's hard to put into the language because it is really a different sensibility that can't be explained by by simple techniques. All right, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any, Stephanie, before we wrap up tonight. What do you mean by duplicating the wounds of the past? Well, duplicating the wounds of the past are imposing on you something. It's me being right and you being wrong. It's me knowing more than you, right? We as parents do that to our children. We react with anger, with frustration. Because our capacity gets taxed. We don't we're not Gandhi. We're not Yoda. Right? So so we do that. And so what you try to do as a therapist and as a parent as you grow is you try not to do that. It's like here's an example. Um who was I talking to? I was talking to a friend. So this is a friend example. And a friend um had another close friend that experienced a lot of really unhealthy behavior from from her. And so she, we were talking, she said, you know, her friend now is in, in sobriety, in, in recovery. And her friend wants to make an amends, and she's not ready for that right now. And I said, in a way, 
she's kind of doing it to you again, even though it's an amends. If, if I've hurt you, right? I, let's say I stole from you or I lied to you or I did whatever I did to you. I did it to you. That's what trauma is in part. It's, it's something that you have no control over that gets done to you. If I do that to you, and then I decide when and how I'm going to make amends, I'm doing it to you again. That's why with siblings in our program, I often tell the parents, give the siblings some space. They had things done to them that were traumatic. And now they're being asked to forgive or to write a letter or maybe even a letter of accountability. And the reason they're resistant is because they want to take back control. So we have to be careful as therapists and parents not to do it to our children, not to impose our truth on them. That doesn't mean that I can't set boundaries. I get to set boundaries. But I don't impose truth on you. And if I come in just trying to manipulate you, I'm doing the same thing that has been done in the past. That's what that means. Even though it looks good. At what point with your child would you suggest providing advice versus listening? I say that because I am grateful when others have provided me with valuable advice. It's an art. I'm reluctant. I'm slow. And I think my children are, all, are also very sensitive to the fact that I take up a lot of space. Right? I have a thousand stories. I'm very verbal. And so I think my children are, are especially sensitive and aware that it would be an easy dynamic for me to take over. So ideally, I, I make sure that they're heard. In, the, in my book, I talk about this idea that there, there's got to be a pause. There's got to be a place. They've got to be able to stand on a stage and tell their story and be heard without anxiety, without me anticipating that I have a great answer, I have a great solution, I have a great story. I, I, I put that to the side. In reality, I put that to the side. That energy is not there. Then when they are contained, then there's a moment, and it could be a moment later, it could be minutes later, it could be a day later, it could be a year later, it could be five years later. There's a moment when I say, I have a thought about that. Are you open to it? Uh, there's another part in the book where I talk about ask the intention. You know, what would you like me to do? You want me to just listen? Or if you're the center, state the intention. I talk about that in the eight tools for transforming relationships. So, yes, there's a place to say, here's, what, here's what's worked for me. And I, and I think that language is important. Uh, we, we, we spend a lot of energy and specificity at Evoke to say, we, we ask you not to use words like have to, must, need to, should, ought to, good, bad, right, and wrong. Because it changes the dynamic. It, it, it does exactly what we're talking about. Instead, we invite you to say things like, here's what my experience has taught me. Or here's what I've, I've found out for myself. This is what I know. This is what my experience has led me to believe. That kind of language is different. So I think, give them space, make sure they're heard, put to the side the anxiety about the great lecture that you have in your back pocket, check in with them about what they would like from you, and then when you do share, share it using these kinds of phrases and ideas so that you're not imposing the truth on them. You're just sharing from your experience what has worked. And then if they dismiss it, this is this is kind of the test if you're doing it well. If they dismiss it and you get attached to it, get defensive or try to argue with them, then you know you're too attached to it and you're not, you're not meeting them where they're at. But if you say, here's what I've learned from myself is when I've been in a similar experience, I've done it this way, and they say that's the stupidest idea ever, then your response is, Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. And you're not attached to it. So yes. And you'll know when, it, when you're doing it too early or too often or too much because you'll get resistance. You'll get an argument about why that doesn't work or doesn't apply. And what, what, you're, what you will hear in that moment is, oh yeah, I miss them. I miss them. I, didn't, I, I wasn't connected to them. I was connected to my agenda. All right, thanks for the questions. Upcoming intensives, we have, a, we have a spot left at the intensive, January 15th to 18th that I run in Park City. If you want to go to that, uh, that should fill up by the end of this week. So let us know if you want to do that. Contact intensives at evoketherapy.com. Stephanie will be in contact with you. Then we have a couple more coming up. The next workshop will be January 28th and 29th at Entrada in Utah. We would like all current families, if they're able to go, to come to those. You can also set that up in conjunction with a field visit. 
if your evoke therapist thinks it's appropriate. We would like all parents to go to tw 12, excuse me, six 12 step support groups while their child is with us, either Al Anon or CODA or Families Anonymous or Naranon or Alateen or any combination of those. Also, you can go to nami.org, N A M I.org, and find free resources or affordable resources and information in your area or online. I'll be in New York City Wednesday, so I'm looking forward to being back. 6 30 to 8 30 p.m. Um, there's the address there, 5th Avenue, 365 5th Avenue at Cooney. And then uh, in Los Angeles on the 29th, same format as before on a Sunday so that we'll miss the traffic, have a potluck before, and then the parent meeting from 5 to 7. And then in the Bay Area on January 31st. We're doing it in the, closer to the South Bay this time because we've always been in Marin, just trying to mix it up. We're doing this by request. We'll do this uh, at the San Mateo Marriott, which is the San Francisco Airport Marriott, 7 to 9 p.m. I think that's actually 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. I forgot that. Let's make sure we check on that, Stephanie. Email stephanie at evoketherapy.com or RSVP for more information. To RSVP for more information. Follow us on social media. Remember, all of our podcasts are now being turned into, all of our webinars are now being turned into podcasts. And all of the live ones are, are put into podcasts by the next day. You can go to the, uh, the uh, iTunes uh, app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. Or if you have an Android device, download the SoundCloud app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram or Facebook um, to find out more information, to get announcements if you miss them in your spam filter. You can follow the Second Nature Alumni Foundation on Facebook. That's a foundation that is set up to help families that can't afford therapy. Also go to our blog. Pursuit trips are for families or young adults. They are sober fun, led by our therapy staff. It's Therapy Light. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent where I, I referred to several times tonight is, is available on paperback on Amazon or uh, you can get an, an audio version through Amazon on Audible. Follow the, go to the Parent Alumni Foundation book page to look and buy books that have been recommended by a therapist and a, and a portion of those go to help people that can't afford therapy. All right, another question just came in. I asked the intention of the call with my son last week. It worked to de-escalate. The crazy making and verbal attack. It works so glad I remembered. It's, a, it's, it's really one of the most amazing skills and it's so easy to forget. Just ask the intention. What would you like from me? What are you intending? What do you want me to do? And then you can decide if you can do that. But it, you know the, the eight tools that I talk about for transforming relationships, webinar, podcast, paper that I wrote, it's, it's one of those skills. It's, I, think it's, I think it's the most underutilized skill in, in all of the communication skills that we teach, which is what would you like from me? And again, you can hear how that fundamentally approaches the relationship differently. I don't assume I know and then step into that. I check in with you about what you would like from me, and then I get to decide if I can do that or want to do that for you. So I'm glad you shared that. Thank you. Is that it, Stephanie? All right. Thank you, folks. I hope, hopefully this was a helpful point of contact. I'll see some of you in New York City on Wednesday. And then next Monday, we are going to do one that is how to talk to your kid about how to talk to your kids about drug drugs. This is based on a presentation I'm doing in New York City for the Jewish community in, in Brooklyn. I've been asked to come and speak. I'll be doing that Sunday night. So I'll share with you my thoughts from that event and, and, and what I learned as I prepared and, and planned and executed that talk. That's Monday, January 9th. We're going to do that at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. That's a different time notice. I'm going to try to make, for those of you who want to watch the National Championship football game that night, a little bit more time to watch it. Have a great week, and I'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.